Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Today's event continues our celebration of trailblazing women as we prepare to celebrate Mother's Day on Sunday. We've spent the last year honoring women who have achieved amazing things, who've broken through glass ceilings. And today we take a moment to honor mothers. Recently, the New York Times examined how the pandemic has disrupted work and home life, really, especially for mothers who have been stretched so thin, acting as caregivers, teachers, and earners all at once. So today we take pause and celebrate all mothers and what they've achieved, especially one very creative mother, author and illustrator, Cosby A. Cabrera. So we're thrilled to welcome all of you as we partner with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which was founded by Carter G. Woodson in 1915. Having launched our partnership during Black History Month this year, we are thrilled to continue the collaboration to ensure that important voices are heard. In addition, we always like to welcome numerous libraries and local PBS stations for sharing this conversation with you. We are pleased to be able to share experiences meet, meeting authors and illustrators monthly. Today, I am pleased to welcome WTTW's Tim Russell from Chicago, who will introduce our special guest. Welcome, Tim. Hey, Heather, how are you? Thank you for having, uh, allowing us to participate today. Well, we're so glad to have you. It is always such a pleasure to partner with you, especially when we're highlighting people from the Chicago area. Yes, thank you. And uh, as Heather mentioned, everyone, my name is Tim Russell, Vice President, Community Engagement and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for WTTWWFMT. And on behalf of Sandra Cordova Misek, our president and CEO, our board of trustees, welcome to Author Talk for Kids with author and illustrator Cosby Cabrera. WTTW is committed to producing and presenting trusted best in class content fueled by distinctly Chicago sensibility. We have served as Chicago's window to the world and our purpose is to enrich lives, engage communities and inspire exploration. Through our broadcast and digital platforms, we educate and entertain children and families and share the stories of women and men who have influenced Chicago, America, and the world. I had the opportunity to interview Cosby Cabrera last year for a PBS Books conversation. What I took away from that conversation is that Cosby is a true Renaissance person. She is the epitome of creativity in every way, fashion, and form. Cosby is an illustrator, an author, and a doll maker. But most important, Cosby has a deep commitment to children learning about different cultures and inspiring young girls to reach their full potential. WTTW is proud to partner with PBS Books and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History on today's Author Talks for Kids Conversation with Chicago's very own author, and illustrator, Cosby Cabrera. Without further ado, please welcome Cosby Cabrera. Tim, thank you so much for that. And thank you so thank much, you. Heather Marie and um, PBS. And um, I didn't get all of the, is it WTTW? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thanks for having me. It's my thank pleasure you. to be here. Well, Tim, thank you so much for that introduction and welcome Cosby. It's thank so you, great Heather. to have you. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> it's so great, Cosby, to have you back on PBS Books. Uh, as Tim said, you know, you are a designer, a doll maker, an illustrator, a writer, and a mother. Uh, you are a true creative, a trailblazer yourself. Um, so before we jump into this book, I, I'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself and your artistry. Yeah, um, so you know, I was trained as an art director and I did um, music packaging for Atlantic Records and Sony Music and it really was my dream job. And um, I love the idea of like working in a truly creative environment um, and the sky was really the limit in terms of uh, creative expression uh, for designing for music. 
Um, and then I left that to start to make these handmade dolls. And, um, and while I was um, uh, art directing and designing um, for music, I was also illustrating for children's books. So, you know, it's just uh, sort of not quite a linear path. Um, um, and I think that there's so many of us that have so many um, facets of our expression and ability and capability, but oftentimes we talk ourselves out of things. And um, I would just say that there's nothing so extraordinary except that I have never talked myself out of um, exploring or pursuing or experimenting a little bit with um, the things that I'm drawn to. So I know we want to get to your book, but before we do, I wondered if we could share maybe an image of or two of your handmade dolls, because I don't think everyone's heard of them. We've now mentioned them a few times, and I thought it could be a great way, because in fact, I saw one of your handmade dolls illustrated in the book, I think. <laughs> yeah. So what are we looking at? Yeah, so these were done out of uh, linens and tissue linens, and in this case, you know, I did uh, utilize uh, vintage um, laces and uh, bits of embroidery and um, uh, hand dyeing of the tool uh, with either teas or natural dyes. And I think I might have mentioned also the hand beading for the for the crowns here. And this series was entitled um, the Dulce Dolls. Dulce meaning uh, sweet in Spanish, you know, like a little bite of candy. And do you speak Spanish, Cosby? Um, so Spanish was, I come from a generation where Spanish was my parents' language, um, and that's what they used to communicate with each other without necessarily closing the door. Um, and <laughs> back in those days, I'm dating myself, um, they didn't want their children to have difficulty in school. Um, so they insisted that we speak English in the house, um, even though there were some words um, that we use that were Spanish words that I didn't even recognize as such until I went out to the, you know, outside to play with other kids and no one knew what I was talking about. You know. <laughs> yeah. I understand. <laughs> um, okay, well, I, there was, you know, just to say that the artistry and I can see that detail from those images are, it's just amazing. And I would say the the detail and that creativity you know, translates very much as as we're going to jump into your book, Me and Mama, which is a Caldecott and Coretta Scott King honor book. It's really celebrates the mother daughter relationship. And we wanted to start by seeing, you know, what inspired you to write this book? Yeah. You know, oddly enough, it was my daughter who at the time was three years old, uh, wanted to get me a cup of water. And so she placed a cup on our water cooler ledge and then used both hands to squeeze the spigot. And of course the, the cup went crash kaboom onto the <laughs> ceramic tile. And that was the end of that beautiful uh, favorite cup of mine. And um, what I did was I gathered up all of the shards and, and uh, larger uh, pieces and I wound up keeping them because it it's still, um, I don't know, it resonated as beautiful, even in that state and condition. And I had this urge and desire to paint it. And so I saved those pieces. And that's when I, you know, I said, you know, these string of moments that we are sharing now, um, you know, it, it's like this notion of the days are long, but the, the years are short. Um, I wanted to capture those string of moments. And so I just began a little bit of um, note taking not even in a, um, in a charged or, or deliberate kind of way, just, you know, in an easy sort of way. And that's how me and mama came to be. And how long did the book actually take you to write from start from idea that you just mm -hmm. described to finish? Yeah, so the initial idea, yeah. I would say, you know, um, just a, you know, a few weeks, um, and then it went into circulation. Um, and then it wound up uh, being sold to Deneen Milner Books through Simon Schuster. Um, and in that process, you know, of like, um, you know, getting the contracts ready and that sort of thing, I decided I would go back into it and, um, and revisit and bring a little bit more um, detail and language and nuance, you know, and, and that happened fairly quickly as well. Um, so it's a kind of thing that, you know, it's like quick on the execution and long on the simmering. 
<laughs> okay. So before we delve into that a little further, let's take a moment to watch a video about me and mama. Fantastic. Me and mama, an ode to the everyday. The everyday, a string of moments from good morning to you, good morning to you, to good night. It started with a cup, my favorite cup of all time, and my three-year-old was trying to get me a glass of water, unsolicited. It was at that precise moment that I recognized that joy sits squarely on the shoulders of equanimity. Early on, I saw it as a simple book with very sparse language. We would trace this tenderness between mother and daughter through their everyday objects. In the same way an anthropologist might surmise a number of things about a people by rummaging through their objects and everything of theirs that was tethered to utility. I would show very little of this mother and daughter, few suggestions, half hints, maybe a spread or two. But for the most part, the challenge was to let the story in and allow the reader to fill in the gaps and bring shape to the text. After revising, the question of to show or not to show became where will this go? And it was now about the string of moments where time is irrelevant and the soul is being nourished, watered, and fed. It's that adage about the days are long and the years are short. And there's time to play. And when we have no idea what we're doing and we're allowed the space to do some things imperfectly. Until we get it. When it's raining, we find the fun. And something like getting into the shower, a potential friction point, reminds us of that rain. And we get to compare and contrast because that's how we sort and connect our dots. Observe and say or think this to that. Not this, but that. And the dark, the thing we fear, and from which we hide. Is waiting for us. So we can get to the rich stuff, those places we get to process and replay, and even conjure up reminders of who we love and who loves us and how we share those string of moments from good morning to good night. Welcome back. You are watching PBS Books, and we are here with Cosby A. Cabrera uh, discussing her book, Me and Mama. You know, I love in the video how you are able to share your unfinished sketches, um, to delve into that compare and contrast of images, to even, you know, share about the, the thought of it being an anthropological study. Um, and you know, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your process for writing a book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, did you, in the beginning, how, how you started? Did you start writing a manuscript? I um, did. Okay. Yeah. Can so, you... it, yeah, it started with the manuscript, uh, Heather Marie. And then, um, you know, I also included um, just some treatments, you know, maybe uh, three or four uh, spreads um, in gouache. Um, to show that I really want this to read uh, fairly simply, you know, um, uh, and, and so just to give a sense and idea of direction, you know, um, yeah, and then I, I wound up building on the manuscript a little bit um, and um, going to paint these, and that's when I uh, wound up painting them in acrylic as opposed to the initial wash that I had presented. Why did you choose acrylic? Is it easier to utilize or does it reproduce better? Why was that your choice? Yeah, because, you know, oil oil paints are really my preferred medium. Um, um, and the very first books that I did were in oil, but oil paint does not dry very quickly. Um, and for something that's done commercially where you have to deliver it on time, um, it's not the best thing. I remember that first project and I had done it in oil and it wouldn't dry. And so I had to find like a, a toxic little Krylon spray to um, as a fixative to spray on the surface just so that I could go it and ship in time. Um, and so acrylic affords me 
um, you know, the opacity um, of oil paint, but without the toxicity um, and it dries really quickly. You know, your book not only, um, it's not only beautiful because of the illustrations, but the words are really lyrical and they're and poetic. Um, and I wanted to kind of give you the example. I, I loved how when you show the images of the, the, um, the cups, um, it, you wrote clink clink versus da da, and at, you know, and then how they break. Mm -hmm. um, and throughout the book, you really provide images of things for a mother and a smaller version for a child. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had a favorite pairing um, that you included. Um, you know, I wasn't necessarily thinking in terms of favorites. You know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I just think, you know, children are so new in the world, you know, their eyes are roaming everywhere. I had one young mother um, say that she was going to strip her room of only the essentials because her baby was so distracted. And, mm -hmm. and my thought was like, well, it's their almost like function to be distracted because there's so much, so much firing going on in the brain and, you know, they're connecting their dots. They're just so brand new to this physical world. Um, and and I think that children are also our first poets, you know, the, like the the things that they say and the way that they say them, there's some real originality um, to that until they become sort of like taught and schooled and, you know, and sort of like trained, you know. So I just wanted to offer a little bit of that, you know, sort of eyes roaming, connecting dots and just like being so much of an observer, even of the small little what we might con uh, consider minutia, you know, um, is large and looms large in a child's eyes. Yeah, but the way you do it is so clever. I, I'm someone who has a four-year-old daughter, right? So as I read this book, uh, you know, enjoying the daily routine from doing your hair to eating to splashing in water on raining days in, in muddy puddles, we, we call them, right? I, it's so fun and heartfelt. Um, and I just want to say that as a mother, I felt why I wanted to interview you right before Mother's Day was because I feel like it's a tribute to motherhood and that yeah. journey. Yeah. Um, and, and you help us to, to almost look outside of ourselves and say, this journey everyone's going through with their daughters too. And that's such a beautiful thing. Um, I was wondering if you had a favorite ritual that you expressed in this book. Um. You, you know, I I um I think like getting a child into the shower oftentimes, <laughs> you know, can be like really really trying. And so um so this idea, you know, that for example, the the daughter's comparing the shower to outdoor rain, which is something she's going to experience um, a little later on in the day. You know, I think that rituals are just so um, incredible uh, to have um, because when a child can sort of almost anticipate what comes next, it gives gives them the freedom to regulate themselves a little bit, you know, um, so they can even dance their way into the bathroom because they know that that's something that they ultimately will do because this is something we do all the time. Um, so there is something about ritual um, and there is something about really the everyday, you know, the everyday I think we take for granted because there's something so ordinary about it, but so much is happening, um, even with our children. You know, they're they're being imprinted upon, they're being noticed. You know, and and um, and and we learn from them and learn about them. You know, by by the watching that we do over them. And there's something very special also to know that you're new in the world, and there's someone that has made it their intention to watch over you and take care of you. You know, it's like, I think it's not something that we need to take for granted, even though it happens in our everyday. Cosby, you've made so many good points, not only in just expressing that. And I think it's why um, with Mother's Day, when I sometimes think of it as a as a day better than my birthday, right? oh. <laughs> because it's a day that people say, "Oh my gosh, like you made this choice," and the, and yeah. these are are people that you're you, you're trying to um, guide through yeah. life and make 
socially responsible adults, hopefully, yeah. fingers crossed, right? <laughs> um, you know, that's the goal. Yeah. Um, Cosby, is there an excerpt or something you'd like to read from your book or an image you'd like to share? Yeah, you know what? I wouldn't mind uh, reading just the last uh, two pages. You know, it's not very word heavy, but I'd love to do that. My mouth gets sleepy first. The walls are dark except by the window where the stars are hanging. I close my eyes and let the day spin me some pictures. There's Max and Luca and Papa and Mama's laugh and tree holes and tall songs and mossy velvet as green as grass and full boxes and a blue barrette and a whole cup and a beaded window and warm indoor rain. Oh, and oh, there'll be me and mama. <laughs> and that's how we end. It is so heartfelt and so, so sweet. Um, I, I love how you're able to also transition this thought of the dark, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know. I, I think so many children have this fear of the dark yeah. and you in this book have been able to really help the characters and the reader to say, oh, going to sleep is an opportunity to explore yeah. all of the things you love, which is really beautiful, Cosby. Yeah, no, wonderful, you know. Um, and to use the dark, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a metaphor for, for even adults, you know, the thing that we're not familiar with or that is yet unknown, you know, to use that opportunity. And that's why I think it's important um, for like any children's book to be able to speak to a child in, in a way that a child can comprehend and enjoy and also like leave a little something for the adult that perhaps has to do the reading sometimes repeatedly. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's a great point. That actually is a great segue into my next question, which is about you have an image um, where you discuss how a hole in a tree is where the branch was. Yeah. And then it continues and then it says the stores are boxes filled with people. Yeah. And I was hoping you could discuss that line because I, yeah. I read it. I definitely thought that's an adult. That's a line for the adult who's reading, but maybe I'm wrong. So I'd love right. your input. Yeah, so this, the whole, um, oftentimes tree holes um, do form, you know, um, because that is uh, the precise spot that the branch was sliced off and, and sometimes, you know, um, you know, given enough of the right bacteria and, um, and ecosystem, it, it does turn into a tree hole. Um, so that's one thing. And then the stores are boxes filled with people. It's like, that's sort of the child's perspective. That's the child's poetry. Um, and, and that was inspired because I remember someone telling me that she um, came to the United States uh, from, I think the country was Panama, and, um, and she had use of the entire land um, and could pick her avocados and mangoes, you know, freely from her neighbor's yards. And then she then entered into a city environment and she said it was no different than us moving into a series of dresser drawers. And so that's how she experienced um, now going into a condensed, you know, population. And so the stores are boxes filled with people um, is a child's metaphor for, you know, very crowded um, sort of condition. It's really interesting to hear that because when I first read it, I actually thought, oh, that's where, you know, big box comes from, like in terms of big box stores. So I was like, I knew, you know, I was super interested and, and that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that, that background. Yeah. You know, what is the most challenging part about writing and illustrating a book? Because often we have writers and they write over here and then we have illustrators and they're not often allowed to talk to the writer. Um, and so how is it to be both? Yeah, um, I, I think, I think for any discipline, um, the secret sauce is to be in practice in that discipline. Um, and so if you're a writer, you should be writing um, or observing things from your writer's lens um, and finding language for things, however difficult that might be at times, um, like all the time, because it's a muscle, 
you know? Um, so a writer illustrator is essentially someone who's utilizing both of those muscles um, all the time uh, in order to, you know, when you do undertake a project, you know, it comes a little easier. I don't know if that answers the question uh, directly, Heather. No, it, it totally does. And I think, um, you know, this is not the first book that you've written and illustrated. Um, do you want to share a little bit about your your first, it was 2018 the first time you wrote yeah, in? I, I have it right here. It's called, um, it's called My Hair is a Garden. Yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. book as well, Cosby. Oh, well, well, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, and so um, that story came about, you know, because of what was happening in, in my life where people were stopping me on the street to ask for hair tips for natural hair, you know. And when I was dating my husband, he thought it was like so peculiar that people were stopping me all the time asking me. Um, and sometimes, you know, they'd pull out a, a piece of paper or something to write with and the train <laughs> door would close and it was still trying to capture it, you know. Um, and then one day, someone from my daughter's preschool had adopted um, an African-American child and she didn't know the distinctions for her daughter's hair type because no one in her family or herself had ever encountered it before. And so she was asking me for hair tips. And that's when I mentioned the distinction of oil. And I could see her um, visibly recoil because oil is something you remove. It's not something you put in um, deliberately. And and then I thought about that little girl. I still remember her name. And, um, and I thought, you know, one day she's gonna be searching for answers. Um, for herself, and there, I would love it if there was something printed um, that could meet her on that path and journey um, that she wow. could, you know, look for and know that it was like there for her. And so that's what inspired me to to write my hair as a garden. That's amazing, Cosby. That's really great, and I'm glad. You know, I, I feel like the books that exist now and one of my favorite things is they're so different than when I was growing up. <laughs> you know, there's so much selection, but it's also, you know, I feel like creatives like you, you identify a problem and, and you say, I don't want other people. I want to have, I want to create, I want to create something for this um, so that someone doesn't go through what I went through or they have some place to turn and to share that resource with someone yeah. else, which is so incredible, um, really incredible. Um, I wanted to ask you, and I want to remind the audience, if you have any questions, please submit them via chat. Um, but in the meantime, I always like to know what recommendations might you have for reading um, for parents, for their kids? I know as a children's writer and illustrator, you need to always be reading. Um, so is there any good reads you've read recently? Um, so the thing that I, I read most recently is called Girl on a Motorcycle, oh, wow. <laughs> which I love. It's written by Amy um, uh, Novosky. I, I, I'm not sure about the pronunciation of her last name. I, I don't have it, um, you know, with me at the moment. It's on the shelf. Um, um, and it was, I think it was illustrated by Julia uh, Monst Monstad, uh, Morstad. Um, but I love it because it's a girl in Paris who um, makes a decision that she's going to travel all around the world on her motorcycle. So she's in India and she's in Canada. You know, she's just literally gone, um, you know, to and explored all of these many different cultures. Um, you know, and there's a, a little... Um, bit of illustration about the kit that she's carrying, you know, so it's a little bikini, a <laughs> lipstick, you know, her heavy biker boots, a leather jacket. Um, and she also has um, a white dress, you know, so there's one scene where um, she goes into a diner, I forget exactly where it was. Um, and she just dons the white dress and has her dollar dinner, you know, at this diner. But this idea to explore the world, I think it's like a really important idea. And I think it's really important uh, that children grab a hold that there's so many different cultures and perspectives and you can have your own perspective and still be aware that, you know, that there are others, you know. Um, so I do love that book for children. And you know, it sort of like uh, brings us back to the map, which I think it's a very important part of our understanding of the world. Do you, um, 
you know, obviously well, you have a daughter um, from your book. Was there a favorite book you read to her when she yeah. was little? <laughs> um, so the book that I read to my daughter every single night um, until it was memorized is a book by Walter Dean Myers called um, um, Brown Angels. Mm -hmm. And I picked it up as an adult without a, you know, a child um, because I was drawn to it. It was just something very lovely about it. Um, because he collected all of these vintage photographs of little black children um, from the 30s and, and 40s. And I think there were some in the, the, the late 20s as well. Um, and, and these were children sometimes in rural environments whose parents um, might have had meager resource, you know, um, but they scrubbed their faces and dressed their children in their Sunday best. And if there was a roaming photographer that came to town, you know, they made their child ready, you know, for that moment to capture and to document them. And so he collected all of these vintage photographs and it inspired him um, to create really beautiful verse. Um, and so, yeah, so the entire book has been memorized and she's 12 years old, this daughter of mine. Um, and she still oftentimes, you know, in the dark will ask me to recite Brown Angels. Wow, that I, I clearly need a book similar because I have a, I have a oh, 13 year old and I don't think he oh. ever asks me to read to him, no. <laughs> but you know what's really great, even for like 12 year olds, you know, there are certain books that, you know, like we're reading um, together at night and, and I do it as a read aloud. And by then, you know, she's gotten a little sleepy but it's nice, like no matter how old they are, to insert a, even chapter by chapter, you know, night by night, to insert a little bit of that reading. You know, it, it, it really is like, um, you know, feeding by the dropper full. You know, something really does transpire and happen even in, in those moments, you know. Yeah, I think those seeds, those little seeds are magical and they should yeah. translate and continue to grow as, as the, the children grow into adults. Um, we have a question from an audience member, Maria Dolores Para said, um, did some of the images come first before the text um, when you were writing? And the person also mentions that they can't wait to share the book with their students. Oh, how wonderful is that? Yeah, in this case, um, I, I, um, I worked with the manuscript first and then, you know, I broke it down um, to illustrate it and to find sort of the best way to tell the story visually. Um, so the, the manuscript did in fact come first in this case. Um, do you have a favorite hairstyle comes from Lydia? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess, um, hmm, I guess I don't think of it that way, you know, <laughs> um, like I comb my hair every day and like I put it up and sometimes it's a slightly different configuration, you know, than the day before. Um, although, you know, to the outside eye, it may look like, oh, there's that hairstyle again, you know, <laughs> yeah. But um, so I just like um, I just sort of put it away for the day and, you know, and do my day. <laughs> um, so we we are here celebrating mothers. You are a mother. Uh, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. How has that affected your life as a writer, an illustrator, yeah. a creative, a maker and a mother? Yeah. No, it's been really challenging. Um, and I've talked to a lot of mothers and I think that one of the first things um, that has been changed even for younger children um, is the bedtime, you know, like so many children are going to bed a little bit later than they did when they had to um, wake up and, you know, shower, get dressed and make their way to school. So this like um, no uh, transportation time, um, oftentimes uh, children are now cheating by going to sleep a little bit later. And so what that means for a creative person who may um, use the night time, that quiet time when everyone is, um, you know, is quiet um, to think, to dream, to um, create. It's like now it's like less of a window of that time. Um, so like making myself available throughout the day, you know, I've also been three um, meals, short order cooking, and my daughter does have a very discerning palate. So that makes it even harder, like I can't just throw her a sandwich, you know? Um, you know, and so I just, I've embraced the fact that this is 
where we are. And I think making peace with the fact that things are not as they were, um, one. And two, this is just the season. And three, also understanding that the time that we have where we're perhaps spending a little more time with each other than um, even before, you know, it's an opportunity really, you know, um, and just like making peace with the fact that nothing is as it was. Um, and we we're just really making the best of things uh, just to make sure that everyone's okay emotionally. You know, um, I make sure that there's dinner and we're seated at the table at night, you know, not to let that pass that we can look at each other and look everybody in the eye to really get a sense of, you know, how they are, you know, and what they're doing. No, oh, I think those are those are definitely great insights um, and and speak uh, <laughs> very true, ring true for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of we, you know, there's a a few more questions, a few more minutes left of the show. But Cosby, is there anything else you'd like to share with us today? I want to give you an opportunity to share anything that you'd like to share with us and haven't yet had an opportunity to. I, I would like to like to very quickly say Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers, um, those who have yearned or are still yearning uh, to be mothers, uh, those who have taken on their nieces and nephews or neighbors' children, um, you know, because there is some sort of instinct uh, to nurture. Happy Mother's Day to you all in whatever form or shape it, it comes. <laughs> thank you, Cosby. So we are at the close of our show. I need to thank Cosby A. Cabrera for your wonderful words, your pictures, your creativity and artistry, your incredible talent um, for storytelling, helping to bring joy to children and their mothers, um, for letting the story in. I thought that was so clever in, in how you, are, you help us to, to imagine ourselves within your book. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, I'd like to thank the viewers for joining the conversation, and we certainly hope to see all of you again. So from PBS Books, thank you. And until next time, we hope you have a great week. Thanks have for having me, Heather Marie. Thank you. Thank you, Cosby.